Um, okay, I think we're good now. All right. Perfect. Well, my quick question was, um, I have resubmit options under my assignments. And I'm curious if that is something that you would like to see us like revamping our papers, or our work to resubmit or no, just take the um, feedback as feedback and move forward. No, um, that's a really good question. And um, it's possible, I don't have it programmed right, I'll double check it after we're done, but there's no opportunity for resubmissions. Okay, so, so you get the opportunity to submit the outline for the paper, you get the opportunity to have the, um, the question, the outline, and then the paper, but no resubmissions. And okay. um, yeah, the same with the assignments. So yeah, um, I'll double check. Although I want to say I resubmitted because I think the very first one of our assignments that we had to submit our paper along with it that we critiqued, I neglected to do that. So I was able to resubmit and add the paper and re-add the assignment. The, um, I only graded yours once. So I'm not, did No, I think I did it like immediately. Like okay. I realized it as soon as yeah. it happened, not, not days at Yeah, later. if you like submit the wrong paper and then, or you're missing a piece or whatever, um, but, but some classes let you do kind of a rewrite or a second draft. Um, okay. And some of your classes coming up, they actually encourage you, you know, if you, have a, a, you know, on the, a score on the lower side to go ahead and redo it and do another draft. But we have too much to do in here to do that. So okay. just, just move on to the next assignment. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh -huh. um, of course, look at the feedback because the feedback could apply to that next assignment too, but you know, but don't redo it, yeah. Okay. Sure, no, I just didn't want to be spinning my wheels on things that were not yeah. beneficial. It's, it's, you know, there's too much in this class. You got to just keep going. Hi, Peggy. Hi, how are you? Good. We're recording just in case um, some people can't make it and we also kind of just started because these ladies were on so um so welcome and did you want to go next uh did you have sure. a question? yeah so i'm gonna um tell you that i really struggled with the alpha seta priory mm -hmm. i, I I feel like I Googled it. I feel like I read several references and I just couldn't wrap my brain around it. Okay. And, and maybe, and maybe because I couldn't assimilate it, I couldn't find it in my paper. And I realize, and, and I'm assuming that it isn't always just out there. Like this is the alpha set a prior. You know, it's there for yeah. you to extrapolate and for you are asking us to find something to help you r realize our understanding of what that concept is. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you, I, 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 can't, I can't grasp that concept. Cool, let's talk about that. So I think in your book, the best place um, to really sort that out is looking at type one and type two errors. So are you falsely, um, rejecting the null or are you falsely accepting the null? Um, those are those, are those um, the uh, way that we try to design the study is to minimize the chance that you will either reject the null when it's true or accept it when it's, I may have said that wrong. Um, no, I think that's where I was getting <clears throat> tripped up on the double negatives. Yes, it's very tricky with the double negatives. Um, so what you're looking for when you critique these studies, um, the way that you know that they have designed it strong enough to reject the null when they should is if they have a big enough sample size. 
And the way they figure out if they have enough big, a big enough sample size is um, usually you will find in the paper that they calculated a power analysis. And depending on um, the statistics they're picking and the approach and the design, they should say they set alpha, usually it's at um, 0 0.05. So that's just saying, you know, 95% of the time we're going to get the right answer and it's not going to be by chance. Okay, and, so I, I did find that. Okay. That it wasn't defined as the alpha, but it, we did have a 0 0.06. So that means that well, 90 percent of the well, time, or is that not the right? Well, did they, was that in the results or was that in what they set as their alpha to do the power analysis? I, don't have, oh, I can look up my paper. Um, I feel well, like. So hmm. the other thing then you're going to set, you're going to set that alpha at, at 0 0.05 usually. Okay. Um, unless, and I just uh, finished uh, revoicing a PowerPoint and posted it for next week, um, unless you have a reason not to, and that would be um, that you're doing um, multiple comparisons, and so you need, to, you need to be more rigorous about that. So then you might set alpha at point zero 0.01 because you want a bigger sample size to make sure that you're not making a mistake with, um, with accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis. And the other thing that'll help you think about this is go back to that bell curve, and you know it's one or two standard deviations from the edge. That's kind of helping you decide, okay, my answer is somewhere under, under the majority of this bell curve. That's where they come up with all this stuff that they base the statistics on. So what you're looking for in these um, articles is did they figure out what sample size they needed ahead of time? And if they got a P of 0 0.06, they should, um, those are not significant differences between the group. So, it's, it needs to be less than 0 0.05. Um, if so point they, zero 0.05 is the standard. Usually. Okay. But, but, the, the, but the exception to that is, like I said, if you're doing multiple comparisons, then you'll um, go to 0 0.01. Okay. So for example, I'm just working on submitting a manuscript of a, of a um, quasi-experimental study we did in Sheridan on childhood obesity. And we had, um, we had a pretty small sample size, um, but we also looked at a lot of measures. We, because it was part of a bigger study and we're just analyzing our little group, um, we're doing a lot of measures and we're doing too many measures for the sample size. So we had to say, that you know we'd go to a 0 0.01 because um, because there was too big a chance that this would be an error. So is that still real confusing? No, it, I everything you're telling me I have written down in the notes that I took from the reading. Mm -hmm. I feel like I was I got I got caught up on the terminology and that was confusing me. And then I added that to the the double negative and I think yeah. I was. Yeah. Rolling my head around meeting that one expectation on the rubric when I just should have followed kind of the path that I was on, I think. Yeah. So, so the thing you want to critique um, in, in these studies is, did they figure out ahead of time how big a sample did they need to, to accurately um, either accept or reject the null? Okay. And the flip side to that, for some like big public health epidemiological studies, they have, you know, the whole population of the United States in the sample, 
and then you're going to find significant differences on every everything you look at because the sample's so big. So that's that's kind of the flip side to it. So you want to know was this sample too small to answer the question, or did they get significance because they had, you know, everybody in the state in the in the study. And that's when for you guys especially, I think you have to add that clinical significance. So is this clinically significant to the population I'm worried about? Oh, yes. Okay. Other questions? It, do you have anything to add, Peggy? Is there anything else to have? It's very confusing. It is. The double negative is so confusing. No, I don't think I have anything to add. I think you said it very well. Very well. Um, I mean, if you're having a, if you want really, really um, tight significance, you could even set it at 0 0.001, less than 0 0.001. Sometimes they do that. But when you're critiquing the study, which is what you're doing, you're just looking, like Bonnie said, for that um, power analysis and what they set it at before they, before they did the study. And for your true experimental design, hopefully they didn't just take who, whoever, but sometimes for the quasi-experimental design, they'll just say it was a convenient sample and we took the 30 people that we had. Well, then you know it, that's just not as rigorous and you can't answer that question of, did they get this difference by chance or can I really count on this? So that's why it's really important that they say something about the sample size um, before they start the study. Okay. And that's so think, how a priori means before the study started. Okay. So if they didn't do an a priori and they, so like the study I'm looking at, like clearly stated that they had a huge attrition rate. And so they, ran a power analysis after the fact and changed it to a power of 80% with a 5% significance. Mm -hmm. Do I do I just speak to the fact that that was run after the fact? And Yes, and that they had, sometimes they call that relaxing the alpha or something like that because, um, because of that, you know, they just, they're admitting we, we didn't get as many as we wanted and we had to so here's what we got based on the number of subjects, but that's a critique of, that's a weakness of that study. Okay. Hi, Melissa, we're just jumping in with questions. So if you want to chime in with anything, go right ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm really just trying to stay afloat and logged on to um, to hear questions others have. Um, it helps to hear you talk about critiquing because sometimes I I think I overthink the critique portion um, versus um, just thinking about whether what they're telling you makes sense and commenting on that. Um, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's really the focus of this class is to help you be a little more critical consumer. And, you know, you're usually so passionate about the topic that you really get into what did they find and what does this mean and how can I use it? But before you get down that road, just make sure they did a good job so that you really can trust it. So you really want to use it. And that's kind of the the point of these assignments is really helping you be critical consumers of that research. One thing that I encountered in this study, and I know it was funded through, they state in their um, postscript that it's an RON um, with NIH funding, but they don't really, they don't specifically say that they had IRB approval. Um, they talk about some of the safety <laughs> measures it's, this study isn't in my um, specific research area. It's just one I found interesting because there's not really true experimental um, mm -hmm. studies in my research area. Uh, but do you find that's common? I mean, it's an assumption that that has happened to get R01 and NAH funding, that all right. of that process has occurred. Right. But 
is not well, stating it in the publication then considered to be yeah different. so they're not following those consort guidelines right because it says they right. should address that and so you can critique it but you can also say I mean, I can tell you NIH won't give you the money until they see that you right. hire people. <laughs> right. I, I know this. They give you a little just-in-time notice and they hold the money over your head until you get approval. So you can assume that they did, but it, it's, it's a critique of how they wrote up the study. So you probably- And that's how I, that's how I have it stated right now, yeah. that it's an Perfect. assumption that it happened, but they mm -hmm. don't- Great specifically state um, that it happened. Mm -hmm. Great. Other questions? Are you doing okay with the readings? Are understanding or running into problems with understanding the books? In all honesty, I appreciate Portnoy way more than Monroe, mm -hmm. Muno. Like, I feel like, you know, is, I'm reading French. Yeah. But I use the index a lot. Make it a little bit more understandable for my. Yeah, I really, even though they're, I think they're physical therapists, but they're very clinical. So it's way, I, I like it better. Paul yes. had me change to a different one a couple years ago, and I just didn't like it as well. I went back to Portney and Watkins, because I think it's, it's clinical and understanding uh, uh, for clinicians and nurses to understand. It just is, puts it in a, a more useful language or approach. Yes, it's definitely more at my level. Any other questions that you want to, anything else you want to talk about? <clears throat> I'm impressed with the, um, the work that you're doing. So far, people have done just a great job and that it shows that you're putting the time and energy into these assignments. So thank you for that. That's good to hear because I feel like it, it is, for me, a lot of <clears throat> dissecting and reading and trying to get the terminology. And maybe as I redo it every single week, it will become more comfortable. Um, yes, but now starting, I mean, I had stats a really long time ago. So for me, like digging back and, and trying to, I feel like I, I realize how naive I am sometimes in reading the articles that I'm reading and just taking them for granted and not necessarily going, this is not really legitimate or responsible publishing mm -hmm. um, if you don't really dissect it. So this will be helpful, but it's still it's still challenging. Especially the statistics can be almost like another language. So it does take some real work and, and I and I know that. So I appreciate that you're staying. Everybody seems to be staying on top of it. <clears throat> I do have one question and you can certainly say no to this. Um, I, I am so grateful to have this, you know, one on one time and being able to ask questions. My only concern about Mondays is it's really challenging to look ahead and then I'll, and you know, I, I sat down to say, oh, I'm gonna start the PowerPoints before we meet today to see if I have any questions. And you know, before I knew it, it was five o'clock, so I didn't really have a chance to get through it. So if this is your only time available, I am grateful for it and would take it. I just didn't know if you had something later on in the week, maybe that would give us some time to get into the material. Yeah, I'm, I am very flexible, so I'm happy to do it whenever. We, um, Christina and I picked the times because we thought they were before, um, you know, assignments were due. So if you were in a, in a panic about something, um, you'd have time, but, but I can do it, you know, you, you guys, you tell me because I can, I'm pretty flexible. And the other thing is you can always email me and we can set up a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. Um, and I will record these because not everybody can sign on, but, but yeah, if there's another day or t a time that works better for you, um, usually every day, but uh, well, Thursday and Friday at four, I can't do, but most other days at four I could do. Okay. 
Okay. Well, yeah. you know, I'll see how it goes and then reach out through email and yeah. I'm happy to watch, you know, the recordings if I am unable to mm -hmm. attend, but I put this in my calendar just so that I can yeah. you know, learn and it, You run the risk of not having your question asked. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, but you'd let me know if there's another okay. day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I you. did have trouble and I don't know. It, it's very well could be the way I have my computer set up, getting the validity um, PowerPoints to open. And I don't know if that's a flash issue. Yeah, it is. And it, um, I've redone them. So you should be, I, um, yes, I redid quite a bit of stuff today. So you should okay. be able to open them. They're now YouTube videos. Okay, um, I haven't looked today, so. Yeah. So, um, so I'm going to try to finish redoing the remainder of those um, uh, as quickly as possible so that for those of you trying to work ahead, I won't be holding you up. Um, but yes, you should be. Um, validity is redone and quasi-experimental is done. So those, those I got redone today, but. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I knew they kept saying flash player was going away. I knew it was happening. I forgot that these needed flash player to pay, play. So it was, it was the email that I got that said, these don't seem to work. And then I said, oh, I know why that is. So I'm redoing them as quickly as possible. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other? I think I heard Melissa say this as well. I didn't find an experimental design, so I, you know, found it that was related to my yeah. project. So I just chose another one, and I may yeah. have to do the same with the quasi. So that's okay. Yeah, yeah, and um, that happens a lot because we're interested in things that a lot of research hasn't been done, and the true experimental design usually is expensive, and you need funding. And mm -hmm. if no one's going to fund it, people aren't going to do it. So it's, it, that's fine. Okay. If it, I mean, even if it's just an interesting RCT, it doesn't even have to be related to your topic. But I just, I like you to find something close to your topic so it feeds into kind of the rest of your program. But, okay. but um, yeah, that's common. Just make, yeah, just make sure it's an RCT. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> that actually is back to Beth's question at the beginning. That is one time when I have you redo it. Because if you critique a study that's not an RCT, I don't, I don't want to take all the points off just because you picked the wrong study. So I, I do, I do have you redo that. But hopefully everybody found an RCT. I think we spent quite a bit of time in intensives trying to go through that. So I hope, I hope everybody has one. Related to that, I found an RCT that because it's an R01, there's several related articles that yeah. are published about it. Yeah. Um, so can I go back and use their secondary data analysis um, for as the quasi experimental? I didn't use, I used the original three arm, um, with the attention control for for this, but then they do a really interesting breastfeeding related um, secondary data analysis um, with that same data set. But I wasn't sure where that fit, and I haven't honestly. I haven't gotten to the quasi experimental readings. Yeah. So so you'll look at um, you'll look at that quasi experimental um, design PowerPoint and look at what the components of that are. It depends on what they did with that secondary data analysis. You can do all kinds of things once you have the data. Um, and actually we have in our honors program students who take our old data sets and do all kinds of things. So you can do exploratory, you can do correlational, or if you still have an intervention, and you're just doing a pretest, post test, you, you could call that quasi experimental, but it depends on what they did mm -hmm. with the data. And okay. it would be fine. It would be fine if, um, if, if there's really, a really post. 
Yeah, if it's really a, if there's an intervention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back and read it. Yep, good. Are there questions on other assignments coming up or you haven't gotten that far yet? <laughs> one week at a time. <laughs> <laughs> one, one day at a time, sometimes an hour at a time. <laughs> See, that makes me feel better about my life. <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we have these, um, you know, these synchronous meetings set up for once a month. If you run into, you know, a roadblock or a panic moment around an assignment before one of these is scheduled, just, just email me. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Sort it out either by email or set up a, an individual meeting. Thank you. Don't Thank panic. You. <laughs> no, no panicking allowed. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions that you're thinking of? So the quasi-experimental and the experimental critiques are pretty similar. Um, you know, you're going to be thinking about those same things. Um, so those two, I don't. And as I said, most people did really well with the with the instrument critique. So I think I think you'll. Be Bonnie, can I give a tip just in writing it up? Because yeah, I was reading please. some of them today. Please. Be sure um, you use headers. It's much easier to read the paper, and you can get your headers right from the rubric, mm -hmm. so that you're organizing your paper that way. Um, it's just much easier to read read them. Peggy, if we have a question or a you know, some of mine, some of those headers are pretty short. Is it okay to combine, so, like, if there's a side-by-side, -side, say, theoretical framework and literature review or something like that? Because in this study, they just sort of tack the theoretical framework to the end of their literature review. And so I state that, but it doesn't really merit a one-sentence well, right. section Paragraph. or something like that. Right. Yeah, that's fine. And some studies, you know, depending on the discipline, they won't even mention the theoretical framework. So, yeah, then you just have to say they didn't mention one. But, mm -hmm. yeah. But Peggy's right. When we're, when we're uh, reading a lot late at night, it's nice to have the headaches. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's just a good habit to get into when you're writing because that helps you organize your thoughts and it's much easier to write the paper because you can start out with your headers as your outline and then just fill it in. So based on the rubric is always the good way to do it. Just a hint. Thank you. Great hint. Anything else you guys want to I don't have any other questions. I really appreciate this. I'm in between all sorts of meetings today, so I'll probably hop off. But again, thank you very much for setting those up. It, it's very yep. reassuring to be able to touch base before they're due. Yep. Yes. Um, just, just let me know like, if, if the time doesn't work or you have other questions before we have another one set up. Just let me know. OK. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Nice evening, everybody. Thanks. You See too. You. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.